in God's Word is Philippians 3, 7 through 10. <clears throat> but whatever were, were gained to me, me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more considered? Everything a loss because the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basics of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. So bit. Good morning. Start with prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that Jesus Christ raised from the dead. That we had a Savior that died for us, that laid down His life for us because of His love and His compassion for us. The fact that He wanted to do the Father's will and reconcile us back to God if we would just put our faith and trust in Him. But also, Lord, that He had the power over the grave. That we know that there is a mansion there built for us in glory. We thank You and praise You that Jesus Christ walked the face of this earth. That there is an empty tomb and that He empowered us by the power of the Spirit to live a life with power, resurrecting power. May we bring glory and honor to You with our lives. May we pursue Your will and Your kingdom come instead of our own. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I entitled this message, The Persecuted Church with a Question Mark. The Persecuted Church. Because when you're reading through Acts, you see the persecution that's there, but then you see the growth that comes. So anything that you want in life that's worth something is usually hard to get. You have to work at it. If it takes some persecution to know that your family is saved for all eternity, is it really persecution at all? <laughs> Jesus laid down his life so that we would follow in his footsteps. As you're reading through Acts, you read about the way of life that says that you're a Christian. If it takes a little persecution to tell others about Jesus Christ so that they have saving knowledge for all eternity, then it is definitely worth the cost. No one likes persecution. It's not something we enjoy but it's something that God does use from time to time. We see this in the church. And then there's not a problem with complacency, is there? <laughs> there's not a problem with a lot of different things that fight for our worship. If you haven't been reading your Christian in armor, you need to get a copy of the devotional. There's still three up here. They do no good sitting up here. They can't be read sitting up here. So if you don't have a copy, read it. It talks about the struggles that we have, that Satan has been doing this for a long time, that he doesn't give up, that when you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and guess what? The battle probably is going to increase because he wants you to be ineffective for the kingdom. But Jesus Christ died to give you new life, resurrecting power, so that you can live a life that brings glory and honor to God and draw others home. So are you reading your DBR? What does that stand for? You remember? Daily Bible reading. I have heard that a lot of you are. And let me tell you, this is a lot easier than what you had last year. So you're not suffering quite as much. You're not persecuted quite as much. This is easy. Five minutes a day, and then you reflect, you pray about what you read, and we will read through the New Testament together in one year. That is a wonderful accomplishment, something that a lot of churches won't do, something that I pray that each and every one in this church will do. 
I'll even give you another thing to think about today. If you haven't done it, you know how much time it'll take you to get caught up? About 30 minutes a day for five days. Maybe 40 minutes. That's it. You can read through Mark in an hour and a half, and we're not even an hour's worth of reading into Acts yet. So you have no excuse. Are you reading along with your brothers and sisters? If you're reading what went on in Acts, you know that those who believed didn't worry about the things of this world. They even sold their property so that they could have everything in common so that no one would be in need. They gathered together daily, worshiping and praising, reading the Word, studying, telling others about Jesus Christ, even in the midst of persecution. And when persecution came about and got too strong for them to handle, they got on their knees and prayed for boldness. Wow. And as you continue to read, you'll see that their numbers grew and grew and grew. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not really concerned about the numbers that come in here. Jesus will build His church, but it is my job to shepherd you towards maturity where you don't waste your life. And if you do that, the numbers will end whether they're from your own family your own blood or from their outside other people will see your faith God will honor you and Jesus will grow his church look at what we're reading in Acts so we started this week with Acts chapter 8 verse 1 where we saw that Saul was killing everyone or at least he was approving of it it was his mission to destroy the church as you read on, you'll find that it's his mission to almost single-handedly build the church. The irony in God's plans. The things that we have no conception of whatsoever, that God's ways are so much higher than ours. In Acts 8, 1, it says, And Saul approved of their killing him, Stephen. On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered through Judea and Samaria. Because of persecution, they were scattered because they were scattered, they were able to take the gospel message abroad. Would they have done that without the persecution that scattered them? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know, but that was God's plan. I know if it's easier for me to sit inside and watch television or do whatever, that's the easy thing to do. It's harder to get up and go to work or harder to get up and do this or that. And sometimes we feel like we're not equipped to do it. We don't have the strength to do it. But I can tell you this, just like Paul said sitting in prison, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And while he's there, he's writing the New Testament. Who would have ever thought that? While he's there, he's witnessing to the Gentile world and people are coming to salvation. While he's there, others have to take up his mantle and go on and carry his work to others because he's there locked up. Would they have done all these things had God not done this through his will and his might? Our God works in such a wonderful way that Satan thought he had victory when Jesus Christ went to the cross. <laughs> Resurrecting power because our Savior laid down his life for his sheep. Are you listening to his voice and are you following after him? These are Jesus' words from Matthew 28, starting in verse 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, as a result of this, he is in authority, not the devil anymore. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, don't forget this, don't miss this, I am with you always to the very end of the age. As you're doing the commission that he set you apart for, that he equipped you to do, to go to the utter ends of the earth, but it starts, if you notice, at home. Then we go out and we go from there. Are you teaching your children and your family to read God's Word, to pray, to have a relationship with Him, to come to church, to gather together, to do good, to trust in God to supply their needs? Persecution comes from time to time. But even in persecution, you reach up to a Savior for healing, for comfort. That's why Jesus said He was going to send the Comforter. And as I've told you, in Corinthians where we're reading, how can you comfort others 
unless you've received the comfort from God in the first place. Because you know that He's a loving Father that cares so much for you. Sometimes God even uses persecution. Stephen did not consider his life anything compared to the knowledge of spreading the gospel message. It cost him his life. I don't think he planned on dying that day, but I know that he was willing to lay down his life for Jesus' service. As you read on in Acts 8 and verse 2, it says, Godly men buried Stephen and they mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Persecution did not relinquish in any. It increased. A great persecution broke out. He went from house to house. He dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. That's a time that we thank God for persecution. Scripture tells us to thank God always, to rejoice always. When we need help in our fears and our doubts, we need to pray to God to increase our faith. Just as the Christians did in the early church. They prayed for boldness. They didn't pray for an escape from the persecution. But they prayed for a boldness through the persecution. Verse 5, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the message there. That reminds me of the scripture in Acts 1-8 where we read about Jesus' plan. But, you don't need to worry about the who's, how's, and the why's, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and look at there, Samaria. Because of persecution, Philip is ran out to Samaria. And then to the utter ends of the earth. If you keep reading in Acts 8, verse 6, it says, When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. This is not Peter or James or John. This is Philip, a layperson from the church. Because we all are empowered by the Spirit of God, if in fact we are born of the Spirit. If we have believed and put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. And then verse 8. So there was great joy in that city. Wow. Why was there joy? Because they found an answer to their problem of life. Why am I here? What was I created for? What happens to me when I die? They had the peace that surpasses all understanding because they had come to find out about this Jesus, this way. You keep on reading down in verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And in verse 25, after they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. The Great Commission coming to power because of the Holy Spirit empowering a fisherman who denied Jesus, but now preaches Him boldly because He's a new creation in Christ. Because a layperson went out, Philip, and went into Samaria and started the journey. So the apostles came and they spread the, the news all over Samaria, just as Jesus said would happen. You will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. All because of persecution that scattered them. If you keep on reading in chapter 8, and verse 26, it said, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And in the beginning of 27, So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch. That was by chance, wasn't it? <laughs> I know, I looked that word up. Which one, Ethiopian or eunuch? <laughs> so anyway... The Ethiopian, and I'll tell you more about the eunuch later. The Ethiopian meant that the gospel was now going to go to Africa. God at work because of the obedience of his children, even in spite of persecution. 
I mean, what does persecution do to us naturally in our flesh? But it makes us want to avoid it. But here, the people that believed, <laughs> the people that believed had boldness because they didn't think of their life as their own. They thought of it as belonging to Jesus Christ, their Savior and Lord. So now I'm going to ask you that question. Is Jesus Christ Lord of your life? Because He's not Savior if He's not Lord. God's only Son came from heaven, gave up everything, considered His life as an offering for you to reconcile you to God so that you could live the life that God created you for in the first place, to worship Him, to bring glory and honor to Him. That's why we had to go through the Old Testament first and read everything so we understand that. You are sanctified. You are holy and set apart in this world to be a light to this world. You cannot continue going on living like the world. You are holy to God. And He will allow persecution to come if necessary to set you in the position that He has called you to be. To be holy, a holy priesthood, as Peter goes on to write. Priests, making God's will known, His reconciliation known through Jesus Christ because how much He loves His creation. It is His will that all men come to Him. In Acts chapter 9, it starts out with, in verse 1, Meanwhile, Saul still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. It meant that if they professed Jesus Christ and they lived the way that He taught, that it would cost them their life. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any... There who belonged to the way. So you could have hid in the darkness and said you believed and hid your light under a bushel. Right? You could have. But these people professed their Christianity. They were saved. They were born again. And that meant if they showed the way that they lived, which was like Christ, it could cost them their very lives. Whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. I don't know about you, but again, with probability and everything, the church should have been snuffed out. But it wasn't because Jesus will build his church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. If we continue to read on in chapter 9, we get to verse 20. And we find out that Saul no longer is persecuting, is he? Instead, of he's proclaiming Jesus Christ. All this he set up, he put a noose around his own neck, didn't he? But he still wasn't scared because he was a new creation in Christ when he met Jesus Christ. In verse 20 it says, At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished. That same word again. They were marveled. They were amazed. They had to consider this news. They had to take it and look at it personally and say, Who is Jesus Christ? Is he who he proclaims to be or not? So then, based on that, do I put my faith and trust in him or not? They asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on his name? Isn't this the same Saul? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? That's where he was headed. That's what he was going to do. Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept a close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. Now that's natural again, so we need an intervention from God again, don't we? So we've got that word but here, and then we've got Barnabas, that son of encouragement, the son of comfort, the same word for the Holy Spirit. 
God sent a man who was encouraging even to the apostles to come and encourage everybody that Saul had a genuine conversion. He wasn't trying to trap them, anything else. He was a believer and he would lay down his life for his Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. God removed what was the persecution and spread the gospel even more by the man who was single-handedly trying to stamp out the church. Wow, what a mighty God. His plans are so much bigger than ours if we will only put our faith and trust in Him. Verse 31, Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, now we've got the first part of the Great Commission being f fulfilled, and we're seeing it going to the other, other ends of the earth. We're seeing it in a time when the Roman Empire had conquered and it looked like Caesar was God. Now we see the road systems and everything else and the language barrier being crossed and the gospel being taken to the other ends of the known world. And the church in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria <coughs> enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Because again, God through the Holy Spirit comforts those who need comforting. He gives those to peace who don't have peace. He gives joy to those who thought maybe they had joy, but it came and went at times. But He gives them joy like they've never, ever experienced before. And peace that surpasses all understanding. Because they know that their soul is secure for all eternity because they've put their faith and trust in Jesus. Living in the fear of the Lord... We're back to the Old Testament and the beginning of wisdom that fear of the Lord versus fear of men is where our fear should be placed. But perfect love drives out all fear of judgment, doesn't it? Because we've been reconciled, we've been put right by the blood of Jesus Christ, by His deeds. He went as a sinless, spotless lamb and laid down His life in our place. Who would do that? Jesus would, and He did for each and every one of us. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. The church continued to grow. I wonder sometimes when the church in the United States is not growing, if it's because of our complacency. Because the church is growing, and guess where, more than anywhere, persecuted regions. Because Jesus brings comfort. He brings peace. But you've got to put your trust and faith in Him. You can't just say, I'm saved and I know it, and not let your life surely show it. You were called and set apart, made holy, to be God's instrument of reconciliation, Jesus' hands and feet to the world. The chapter continues with Peter's faith, the power of the Holy Spirit, moving among the people and the church growing. Jesus' church growing and nothing stopping it. And then in Acts chapter 10, Luke's, Luke writes about Cornelius, a Gentile, his belief and his obedience. The story continues with Peter's vision and his obedience. And as you read that, you understand that Peter's still a work in process. <laughs> He's still a hypocrite just like I am. I need to repent daily of the way I think and know that God's way is perfect. My way is not. That I need to be humbled. That I need to rely on Him. I need to put my trust in Him. Peter still had to be reminded that the rest of the world, Jesus Christ died for also. I'm going to remind you of the Great Commission again. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, because of that, go and make disciples of all nations. 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Peter goes and meets with Cornelius, and another preaching opportunity happens. Another chance for the gospel message to go into the utter ends of the earth. Another chance to see that it's not because of my righteousness, it's not because of my heritage or anything, but by, by God's grace alone that we are saved through faith. Not by any works, not by who we are, not because we've gone to church, not because our family went to church, not because we're a Jew, but because God's gift of salvation is free to all who believe. In Acts chapter 10, verse 27, it says, While talking with him, Cornelius, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit to a, a Gentile. Well, that's a law that needed to be changed, wasn't it? But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius obeyed and sent for Peter regardless. He didn't worry about, will Peter come, what the outcome is going to be, anything else. He sent because God gave him a vision and he obeyed it. In verse 33, So I went, sent for you immediately, and it was good for you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to, li to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. <clears throat> oh, how God loves for His children to be obedient, and oh, how he works through them. Verse 34, Then Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. That fear in the Lord that brings about wisdom so that you can see that you need to put your trust and faith in him, not in created things. All these things that the world tries to tell you that Satan uses for these distractions and these lies, these comforts for you, are not real or genuine. They have no lasting value compared to the everlasting value of knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. Because then you know the Father. Because Jesus is the exact representation of the Father and He laid down His life so that you could be reconciled to God. Verse 42, he said, He commanded us to preach to people and to testify that He is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. Everyone will answer to Jesus. All authority has been given to Him. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Verse 43, All the prophets testify about Him, that everyone who believes in Him receives forgiveness of sin through His name. Jesus. That's the difference between every other religion. That's the difference between heaven or hell. What do you think about Jesus? Is He your Savior? Have you made Him your Lord? In Acts 11, it goes on to teach us more about hypocrisy. That we shouldn't say one thing and do something else in our heart. Peter has to confront this and he has to decide if, that, if Jesus is Lord or not. Because Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Peter had to decide if the law that he had been taught, if how he would be viewed with his peers would matter or if he would obey Jesus Christ. In Acts 11, verses 1 through 3, the apostles and believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him. And they said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men, and you ate with them? But see, Peter was obedient to Jesus. How many times have we disobeyed Jesus when we felt a calling to go to someone and we said we're not equipped? 
or we don't want to go to this person because of this or whatever the reason is. Listen to God's voice. Be obedient to what He calls you to do. And don't forget you're to be called to be a fisher of men. If you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that He is the chosen one of God, that He will save you from your sins, you cannot deny that you are a fisher of men. It is your calling. It's why you still breathe and walk this earth. Write this next verse down. Acts eleven seventeen. Memorize this one. So whenever you're in doubt and you say, well, I just don't really want to do this. I don't have the time or whatever. Think of this verse. So if God gave them the same gift He gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I can stand in God's way? God will use you one way or the other. Look all throughout the Old Testament. The thing is, is will you let Him use you for your glory because you submit to Him? Or will He use you for His glory anyway? If you've been born again, don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit empower you and watch the results. You've heard me say it before, I'll say it again. It's, the book is entitled Acts or Acts of the Apostles, but it's Acts of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit of God moving through men who were obedient, who were willing, who feared the Lord, who did not consider their lives as anything compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. Remember Jesus' words from John 13. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that, I, that you are my disciples, if you do love one another. And then just a few verses later is when Jesus asked Peter, will you really lay down your life for me? You are called to give up your concerns, your lives for Christ's agenda. He laid down His life to save you. What can you do besides give back your life as an offering to Him? That's why Paul penned the words, I beg you, I plead with you by the mercies of God. You deserve death, but instead He gives you eternal life through Jesus Christ. I beg you by the mercies of God to lay down your lives as a willing sacrifice. Pleasing, holy, acceptable to God. It's your reasonable, prudent act of service. Why would you not do that? It's simply logical. The early church did that. And the early church grew in persecution and they grew in peace. They grew. Because they were obedient to God despite all the circumstances around. They walked by faith rather than by sight. And God moved through them. In chapter 11 and 9, verse 19 it says, Now those who had been scattered by persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also. The Great Commission moving out to the known world, just like Jesus said, because of the power that would come upon those who believed to be a new creation in Christ. Where someone who would deny Jesus three times and do it progressively worse each time, even though he walked physically with Jesus for three years, who said and led the other disciples, now is a new creation in Christ, and He boldly leads others. Upon this rock I will build my church. Everything that Jesus said we have is history in the early church. Everything that Jesus promises you and I, you can count on for all eternity. Those who hear my voice will come in and out, and they will find rest for their souls. <clears throat> they went about telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. This is our example of the church. 
a new creation in Christ. Verse 22, News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but this is the way that I read and study the Scripture. They were first called Christians because those guys are Jesus freaks. Their way of living proves that they believe in Jesus Christ and what He taught. Their way of living showed that. By your works. That's not what saved them, but because of the way they lived, the world said they're like Christ. They're little Christ. They're Christians. But Barnabas saw the comfort in that. He said, they're like Christians. Woo! He had no problem with the term Jesus freak. I use that because that's a term today. That guy's a Jesus freak. Well, that's the biggest compliment you can give me. <laughs> that means that I just care about Jesus more than anything else. I can live with that just fine. So he was so excited, he went and got Saul. And all this is going where you think Barnabas is going to be the big one on the scene, and he just backs out of the scene and lets God use Saul the one who persecuted the church to come. Because, when, see, when you're a new creation in Christ, no one can deny that. Your living testimony of who you are now compared to who you were when you were dead in your trespasses and sin is the biggest ministry opportunity you can ever give. And every one of us has a testimony that Jesus wants to use so much if you'll just let him use it. Jacob was, he's not supposed to be talking to me right now, but he texted me about a situation where somebody confided in him something they did. And I said, use your dad as an example. I said, because your dad's faced that sin in his life. And I said, without it, I couldn't use it to minister to so many other people. Use the things that God has allowed to happen in your life to bring him glory and honor bad or good because if you are a Christian now you are like Christ and Jesus Christ has saved you from everything in the past so that you can live like Christ now in the present don't let those things have any power over you as our readings say from the devotion Satan will try to use that against you but don't let him because you are a new creation in Christ empowered by the spirit to bring light to this world if you'll just let the Spirit live through you. <clears throat> Verse 27, During this time some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. Oh, another persecution. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as, as each one was able, decided to provide help. Huh. Christ's hands in action, provided help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift by the elders, by Barnabas and Saul. Compassion. You will know, they will know you are Christians by your love. A new commandment I give you. Had there not been persecution, because we don't even know where our daily bread is coming from, how can we ever learn about this spiritual bread that will nourish us for all eternity. Then Acts chapter 12 talks about Peter's miraculous escape from prison, Herod's persecution on him. In verse uh, 2 of Acts 12, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. Wow, we don't get much out of the sons of thunder, do we? Well, out of James anyway, because the Lord called him home then. Not the same James that you read about later, just so you're not confused. The next James that you're reading about is James, the brother, half-brother of Jesus, who takes on the church. Persecution comes. And in verse 5, so Peter was kept in prison, 
But the church was earnestly praying for God to him. Now we see the power of prayer being brought into the early church. We've already seen it prior because they prayed for boldness. But now we see Peter's escape from prison come as a direct result of God's people praying for him. Even though God's people may not have expected the answer they got. Because when Peter comes to the door knocking, they have enough faith in spiritual things to say an angel is there, but not enough faith to say Peter is standing there. <laughs> pray specifically what you pray for. Pray sp specifically for that person in your family that's not saved, for that cancer that needs to be beaten, whatever it is, and pray with faith that God will take care of it. Now, it might not be the exact answer you want again, but he will work through a praying people. Peter was rele released from prison. And verse 12 says, um, Peter didn't even realize it itself, but when it had dawned on him that he was out, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were pray praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed. She ran back with, uh, without opening and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. Now, I'm going to tell you here, don't do that. <laughs> don't stifle the spirit. Our movie from two weeks ago talked about that because the daughter heard an audible voice from God to go do this, and her deacon dad said, you don't even go to church. How'd you hear a voice? Have faith. Walk together in unity of the spirit. Use the gifts that God has given you to build up and edify rather than to tear down. You're out of your mind, they told, told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James, not the one that's been run through with the sword, and the other disciples and sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place. In the morning there was no small commotion. God uses these things. Among the soldiers as to what had become of Peter. And in verse 19, after Herod had a thorough search made for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and had them executed. You've got a new monster on the scene, Herod. But as you finish out this chapter... Verse 21, On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robe, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a God, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? Now we see someone who claims that they're God. God is serious about the gift He has given you through His Son. He is serious about the Holy Spirit Himself that indwells inside of you, not just a power. He, God Himself living in you. He's serious about your calling to be a light to this world. As you continue to read through Acts, you'll see the mighty things that are done and you'll see the growth of the church. I'm asking you to pray specifically for power in our church to do the same things and how you can specifically be a light to so, at least one person that you can think of so that we can make a difference because God didn't give us a, our pow His power His mighty creating power His resurrecting power just to sit back and not use it the book of Acts is a huge example of that as you're reading through look for that, pray for that and let God use you as you submit to His Spirit. Father in heaven, we do thank You and praise You for Your Word. We thank You that we can come together as a church, empowered by the Spirit, living in unity of the Spirit, given gifts by the Spirit to be Your hands and feet in this world. I do thank You for this church. Lord, I pray that Satan is bound from any distractions in reading Your Word and pursuing Your will over our own will. Let us not be complacent, Lord. Use whatever means necessary to prick your church into action. Lord, I thank you and praise you for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ.
for my sins. Lord, I thank you for his resurrecting power that lives in me. And may that power live through me to be a light to this world and to each and every one that is here that is empowered by that same spirit. Lord, we thank you for this church. In Jesus' name, amen. I got a